Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Every time I've accepted a call, I've had to start over. The skills I used in my previous position are worthless at my new calling. My Bulgarian language skills didn't help me run a church council meeting. My experience in writing funeral sermons and making visits to the sick and elderly didn't help me with the youth camp. My sermon and evangelism skills are useless in Malawi. Now, I've heard men say that they turned down new positions because the new place wasn't much different than the place they were currently serving. And yet, if they received a call to do something totally outside their experience, I doubt they'd accept that position either. Now, people are comfortable with what they know. And we don't like change. And yet, I think it is true that lack of change, lack of being challenged to try something new, makes for a stale ministry and a stale minister. You know, I'm glad that I left my previous congregation while things were going relatively well enough. I don't envy men who are serving at the same place over multiple decades. You know, it takes a lot of courage to grind it out when things are not going as well as they used to. But I have to be honest with you, it is really hard to keep reinventing yourself and hard to figure out what you need to do day after day as a missionary because no template exists for this position. And I wonder what my mission board was thinking when they extended the opportunity to me to be there missionary of publications, what really makes me qualified for performing these duties? Well, yes, I have previous mission experience, but that was over a quarter century ago. The question that I keep asking myself again and again is, what was I thinking when I accepted this call? I have to admit, it's it's rather disconcerting for me to walk into a room And here people tell me, well, you're the expert. What do you think? Hold on. I just got here. I don't even speak your language. I don't know who your translators are. I don't know where the printing presses are located in town. I don't know how to manage a bookstore. Who am I? What do I have to offer? Not much, I'm afraid. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul urges us to give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I might not have much to offer, but God has a lot to offer to all of us. He's the one who qualifies us for his kingdom. Uh, It's not what we bring to the table. It's what his son did on the cross that gives any of us the confidence to do this work. Whether you're a missionary or you're serving in a stateside ministry or you're just fulfilling your calling as a Christian. I may never be able to speak the people's language here beyond a first grade level. But language skills do not 
qualify me to serve in God's kingdom. The number of books that get published during my tenure as the publications missionary is not a factor in God's judgment of my work either. It was Christ who qualified me for this work before I was born. And someday in heaven, it's really only his work that will be remembered. You know, that relieves me of a lot of pressure. It probably will make me easier to live with, too. You know, I get to do this job. It's a privilege because of Christ. So, my prayer to God is that he creates a clean heart in me and restores my joy of serving him so that I lift others up instead of dragging them down. And wherever I've gone, whatever new challenges I've faced, it is God who has been there helping me keep my ears open and my mouth shut. God has helped me to trust my fellow missionaries and the pastors who I work with on our publications committee. It is God who continually reminds me of his peace that quiets all the doubts in my mind. You know, heaven is mine, regardless of whether I ever publish anything or how big my youth group was. It's a privilege to be here, doing this work and giving glory to Christ. Since I arrived in Africa, my job description has changed three times in three years. That shows you that perhaps the most important qualification of a missionary is flexibility. And if you can bend over backwards and touch the back of your head to your heels, it's very helpful. And one of the difficult things that you deal with when you move to another country, amongst all the different cultural differences and variables, is a difference in perspective on time. And nothing gets done without a deadline. I never would have completed a sermon without that Sunday morning hanging over my head all week long. When you're in the ministry in the United States, you've always got a full schedule. You've got classes to teach, appointments with visitors or members. You've got meetings and work days and services to conduct. You are always on the go. There is a huge difference between American perspectives on time and African. Here, because we live so close to the equator, the length of the day is pretty much 12 hours of light, followed by 12 hours of darkness every single day, and the place shuts down at 6 p.m. You don't want to be outside during the night. There's hardly any activities that take place here during the evenings. It's a slowdown from the frantic pace of the United States. It's a difficult adjustment to make, but it's not unpleasant. Now, every day I am pushed and pulled by emergencies and requests and the hard business of living in Africa. Right? What do you do when you're when your water is turned off or your electricity is on the fritz. Be honest with you, I don't feel like I'm going anywhere in particular. You know, the, the big goals that I've set for myself of acquiring cultural skills and language skills and assessing the, the needs of the, the church for its publications it can take a back seat to things, to, to little things like doing the laundry and checking emails and, and time slips away. 
Without the weekly goal of producing a sermon, it's hard to get into a rhythm. And when I first arrived here, we had language classes every evening for about an hour and a half, and that even got old after a while. Because even after several months of study, I still felt like a bumbling fool whenever I tried to talk to somebody in a local language. It's really hard to see any progress day to day. And that's not just for language study. It takes a lot of time to get anything done. And that is a huge difference from the express culture of the United States. On the back of my mind, the clock is ticking, creating a sense of urgency. I know that my parents aren't, are aging. They will need me to return someday and take care of them. Perhaps someday our children will get married and have families of their own. And, and honestly, I am not willing to spend the rest of my life in Africa. Someday I will return to the United States. How do I stay motivated to keep learning language and the culture of the people that I live with? How do I not treat this all like some existential midlife crisis? How do I put down roots and invest myself in this place when my whole life has been one of uprooting myself and my family and moving on to the next place? And on the days before COVID, I think if you asked any American what their biggest complaint was, what would it be? We're too busy. I mean, you've got people working 50 plus hours a week, and then the weekends are even busier, and they come back to work on Monday morning even more tired. There's always endless home improvement projects and running kids to sporting and school events. And then there's the getaways for the weekend. Maybe you spend an hour in church on Sunday. I think in America we could say that busyness is next to godliness. That's why the story of Mary and Martha resonates uh, so well with so many people. You know the story. The two sisters, one of them, Type A go-getter out to treat her guest right, give him a wonderful meal in a clean home environment, and the other sister sitting there doing nothing except listening. And when Martha complained about it to her Lord, he said, Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. And you can't see. It's right in front of you. Now, time is a limited resource. And none of us knows how much of it we have left. It is important to have the discipline to remain focused on specific goals. This is part of managing our time. But... It is even more important to remain in control of your sinful nature and to live for the glory of God. As King Solomon, a, a man who was as busy as anybody who accomplished as much as anyone ever did in this world, Solomon understood that all human achievement is meaningless if it is not dedicated to the glory of God. In the book of Titus, chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I'm not the first missionary to set foot in Africa, nor will I be the last. I am free to serve God with joy, not guilt, because Christ served faithfully. Now, Christ knew that his clock was ticking. 
He knew exactly when it would expire. And yet, his zeal never diminished. Christ invested himself in our humanity. And even now, he still remembers what it's like to be bound by time and space. He slowed down his pace. Think about it. From running the universe to being born, he limited himself to whatever he could get done in his 12 hours of daylight. And yes, the the Gospels tell us that Jesus was busy preaching and healing, and he got tired. But what about all the years of his life that weren't recorded in the Bible? What was he doing during all that time? He was faithfully serving his parents, his community, and ultimately you and me by putting in the time and obeying all the rules that we break. Now, I need to ask God to forgive me for my self-pity, for my worry, and my the arrogant thought that I am wasting my time here in Malawi because I'm not doing things that tickle my ego. Yeah, I need God's help to get a grip on my own emotions for the sake of those around me, so that I do not torpedo their enthusiasm to serve God. And I ask for forgiveness for allowing myself to be distracted from God's ultimate goal of delivering the world from evil. And I need help to see in every moment, in every situation, an opportunity to give God glory. And I also need his help to understand and appreciate even more that the only reason anything I do has value is because his son, Jesus, wasted his time for my sake. Now, next time on Home Ties, American culture is obsessed with youth. Your favorite actor or actress turns 35 years old and are immediately put out to pasture. In the United States, older people are not seen in public, in the media. They are ignored. Elderly statesmen are mocked by comedians and online memes. But in Africa, well, let's just say even Rodney Dangerfield gets respect. We'll see you next time.